JC Direct this week, the NVIDIA juggernaut just keeps on going. Best vehicle and home building stocks on the JSC. Anglo rejects a third BHP offer. Richmond holding on in a struggling luxury market. Pick and pay has a plan. Copper is booming, but careful. This is JC Direct, episode 588 for 28 May. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is, as always, brought to you by Just One Lap. Uh, and let's kick off with that NVIDIA numbers. They came out uh, late Wednesday evening after the close, so the market hasn't really had a chance to di digest them, but there is the aftermarket. We will get to that in a moment. But here is the breakdown of where they get their money, and it continues to be data centers and not only is that growing rapidly uh, but we can see gaming small professional visualization automotive OEM, oem and other small it is around that data center that is where the big money is coming from uh, and if we break it down visually in terms of growth over the last couple of years it's just it's it's frankly astounding where they've gone just in what uh, four or four years i mean it's 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 the the demand for their chips and let's be clear it's not just the likes of Meta and Microsoft and OpenAI who want the Grasshopper 200s and the other chips that NVIDIA's got. Almost everyone out there, you are PepsiCo and you are playing with AI. You're looking at large language models. You're looking at these type of things. Now, you might not be setting up your own data, data center, but you are somewhere down the line. You are using these chips. There's a data center and you're saying you've got to crunch it. Why? Because if you're PepsiCo or whoever you might be, a Best Buyer, you know, and you're on a conference call with analysts and they say, what's the AI plan? And you say, we don't have one. You're in trouble. Now, we can make a very good argument that really, what is the story? What could PepsiCo really do with it? I mean, I don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But you've got to be trying. And that's just it. And that's the key point that the R&D spend from all of these companies, most of it is going into NVIDIA in terms of chips. You know, Microsoft's R&D, well, it's chips. Uh, the CapEx, it's going into chips. Uh, you know, Meta spends billions on CapEx. Well, it's going into these NVIDIA chips. It is huge in their life, and they are absolutely knocking it out the park. Uh, some data. First quarter revenue up 262% uh, to $26 billion year on year. Estimates was $24.7 billion. Uh, net income. 628% up year on year to 14.9 billion. Uh, they basically gross margins of 78.9%. Those are staggering numbers, 78.9% gross margins. They traded over $1,000 in the uh, aftermarket. They closed at 949.50, so it, it picked up a fair bit. We'll see Thursday if that holds and continues, but perhaps... Almost the biggest story is they're doing a 10 for 1 stock split on the 7th of June. What that means is if you currently hold one NVIDIA share worth $1,000, come 7 June, you will now have uh, 10 NVIDIA shares, each worth $100, but equaling 1000 which is where you were before. So no change, but markets love stock splits for no apparent reason. But if stock split is typically bullish for a, a, a stock, it typically sees stocks go higher, certainly in, in my experience. You go short on consolidations, you go long on stock splits. What is the market looking for? There are no sells or, st or strong sell recommendations. Uh, target price is 142 mid-average target price, and pretty much NVIDIA is going to trade there Thursday evening. Uh, and we've got a high of 1,400, a low of 620. But all of that is now going to be adjusted with the new intent in terms of what did we see from those results last night. It was knock it out. NVIDIA continues to be an absolute juggernaut, uh, and it's not stopping anytime soon. There are others trying to make chips. There are others looking to compete. But they've, you know, as fast as they try and catch up, and let's say to some degree they are catching up, NVIDIA just keeps on moving forward. I mean, they talk around seeing unprecedented demand for their chips. So everyone else is getting better, but so is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is not stopping. NVIDIA is not resting. NVIDIA is not saying, you know what, we're happy. We don't need to do any more. Uh, that would be nonsense. They are absolutely continuing to go crazy.
We've got two uh, events coming up over the weeks ahead. Uh, next Tuesday, 28th at 11 in the morning, I'm chatting with uh, Johanna Rasmus from One Invest. We're going to be talking commodities, gold, PGMs, even PGMs are moving, copper, oil. And then on the 20th of June, Standard Bank Power Hour, unlock the secrets of trading as a side hustle. That is 5.30. That is both webcast and in person. Just one lap.com slash events for more information and bookings. So BHP Group came with a third offer to Anglo-American. Anglo-American said we still don't like it. They're making a lot of deal talk around not just the price, but also the, 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 the risk within that deal. They're saying it's going to take a long time, 18 months, quite true. Because remember, the BHP Group deal is unbundle all of Anglo Platinum and Kumba. I've spoken before on this podcast how that will really uh, it'll trash those two shares in the short term. The Anglo plan, Anglo American plan, is to yes get rid of Anglo Platinum, but in a managed process, which certainly they can do. They've got an extension on the shut up or put up uh, rules out of London, which said that basically uh, Billiton had to have an offer on the table, firm offer by 7 p.m. Our time last night, Wednesday, that has now been extended to 7 p.m. next Wednesday, which is the 29th. Richmond results, I hold Richmond. Uh, that's no secret there. I like it. The, the, were the results knock it out the park? No, they weren't. No, absolutely were not. But here's the interesting thing. What we are seeing from the luxury in general is that it is tough out there. What we've got with Richmond, perhaps, is of a tough space. They are running a little bit better. And I think that is maybe the, the, the key thing, is that we're seeing curing uh, even LVMH to a degree. I don't want to say struggling, but not exactly uh, rushing around and, and storming it up. Richmond numbers weren't bad. The market certainly liked them. And it's not looking, it's looking for around 10% earnings growth over the next couple of years. That is certainly not onerous. Uh, trading on a price earnings of around 21. It's also sitting on, how much was it? Is it, I forget how many billions of euros of, of cash that they've got in their, in their stockpile. And that ain't going anywhere. There is some changes in management coming through. Trading just under 2,800. Average price target is just over 3,000. I like luxury, uh, and my preferred in the luxury space is Richmond. Some of the others, I mean, LVMH is just too much. There's just too much in the LVMH space in the, in the stable. Uh, it, it gets, frankly, quite confusing in that regard. So I'm much preferring a Richmond nice, clean. It's luxury. It's watches. It's those sort of things. There's no jewelry and any of that. Uh, that all said, if we look at things like price to book, this is not a cheap stock. It never has been a cheap stock. Of course, that book is, a lot of it is that giant pile of cash that they are sitting on. Uh, copper is absolutely booming. We're going to be chatting about that more next week. When I sit with one invest, copper's having a, a, a really, really strong run of it. I would be cautious of, in fact, we've seen a bit of a pullback already. It got up to 520, and this is per pound because this is the price target that I have or the price graphs that I have, uh, which I get from Coifin. So it is up at 520. It has come back already to 480. There has been a bit of a squeeze in copper. Remember the LME, uh, as did Chicago Mercantile, both banned Russian sales of, of metals, including copper, back in early April. This certainly has created some bit of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a bit of a squeeze in price. But I like the story for copper. We've got more at justonelap.com slash ETFs. There's a local ETN that you can get into, and then there are two offshore ETFs, one for copper, one for copper miners. There are, of course, also a bunch of copper stocks. Those are all available, and certainly you can grab those. Uh, we got a structured product uh, video. We did this. It was the Power Hour last week. We were chatting. We had uh, Kevin Swartz from Standard Bank deliver that for us. He went quite deep into what are structured products and how do they work. And I think that's quite important because th there is, as I've said before, 
kind of some magic happening there, right? They can give you capital protection. They can give you enhanced upside. How do they do it and what sort of different flavors do they have? So that we've got the video. You find it at uh, justonelap.com slash power hour. The full video is there. You can go and give it a watch, about 40 odd minutes. But I really like the, the, the level of detail that he went into and engaged us around that. Pick and pay has a plan. Uh, sure. Uh, we know that pick and pay is an absolute horror story. That is no surprise to absolutely anybody out there. Uh, we saw that coming. There is the horror story that is pick and pay. But what they've done is come back to market now with a sales update. Uh, the sales update is for the 52 weeks ending 25 February. And it is bleak. We know it was going to be bleak, particularly the pick and pay stores. Boxer doing just fine. They're still doing rights issues. They're still going to sell some boxer. The, the market really liked it yesterday when the news came out, pushed up the stock, closed 4.5% higher, had been a fair bit higher at points during the day, but I think the market will take that 4% for this time at the moment. It is, I suppose we could say, what the market's lacking is the fact that there's a plan, not that the numbers were looking good, uh, and, and giving Sean Summers the benefit that he can manage the plan. Now, if you listen to this podcast regularly, you know I held a position back in February, and, and when they came out with the news, it was just way horrier. I was thinking, yeah, maybe a bit of a rights issue, maybe as much, worst case, $4 billion. But then they came with a giant rights issue. They're going to list boxes separately. It was just ugly. It was just messy. I said, thanks, but no thanks. Two local data points, CPI inflation for April came out yesterday, 5.2%, moving in the right direction. I am thinking that we will see rate cuts coming in the September and November MPC meetings. Why do I say that? Because I think the U.S. will cut in July. They can't cut September just ahead of an election. So the U.S. cuts July. We can then perhaps bring ours down in September and November. We'll probably only do a quarter percent down in each. That will take prime to 11 and a quarter percent. We also recorded a primary surplus. Now, what is a primary surplus? It is basically revenue-less expenditures, but not interest. In other words, ignore the interest that we have to pay. And I know you have to pay it anyway. But our revenue came in more than our expenditure, which means we have a slight little surplus, which means we don't need to go and borrow new money. Now, of course, we then do need to go and borrow new money because we have the interest bill. But a primary sur surplus is not insignificant and not something to completely uh, ignore. It is. It matters. It absolutely matters. <laughs> So some results have been coming through uh, on the local JSC, and I want to look at uh, two particular sectors. Let's start off with the motor vehicle sector. Disclaimer, I hold CMH combined motor holdings. We had We Buy Cars results uh, just, re just last this week. So th th there were some, sorry, last week, numbers there. We've had motors recently, CMH. Uh, Zeta, we out of sync with. So the We Buy Cars and Motors was half year, CMH was full year, uh, and Zeta full year results are due Thursday next week, the 30th. We haven't yet had a trading update. But I wanted to talk around We Buy Cars because I particularly like it. I like their model. They are growing. They're doing 14,000 sales a month, which is uh, in impressive numbers there. They're, of course, picking up market share. But if we start to see some decreases in rates, the vehicle industry sector could start picking up some extra sales and could start seeing some a little bit of growth. It can get exciting, just a little bit. We buy cars, of course, as pure secondhand cars. Motus is new cars, secondhand cars, and aftermarket, as is CMH. And then Zeda, and we're talking Zeda, Z-E-D-A. Zeda is very much focusing on it's the car rental. It's, it's, it's mobility as a service. Now, they, of course, are selling secondhand cars that come out of Avis. But what struck me, so dividends, uh, we buy cars, will pay between 25 and 35% of HEPs. That will be at full year, uh, so we, won't, we didn't get it interim. Motors, dividend yield 7.1, CMH 13.4, and Zeta will pay 20 to 30% net profit for financial year 24. So we'll see what that is when we get the results next week. Earnings growth. 
Uh, we buy cars was up 26%. I've cleaned, I've used the, the core earnings because, of course, we buy cars also had a whole bunch in terms of the, the, the cost of listing and the like. Uh, Motors was down 27% on HEPs. Uh, CMH was down 12. Zeta was down 17, but that was for uh, September. So really, we are far away from still getting anything from that. Of course, correction, uh, results we're getting next week are going to be interim for Zeta. But then we get the price earnings. We buy cars 10 times. Motors. 5.2, CMH 5.1, Zeta 3.1. I like we buy cars, but it's just expensive. Why is the market pricing we buy cars twice the other two? We know why, because it says, well, we can go and get extra growth from taking market share. And some of that market share might also come from, from Motors and CMH. Absolutely it will. In the second hand space, most of it's going to come from mom and pops. But twice the valuation? I like the stock. It's just too expensive. Zeta, 3.1, cheapest. But I want to – there's – I'm not liking the price action on Zeta. I want better price action. It's got some sellers. I want it to break some resistance. My pick here is CMH. I've held it for a while. I'm up about 6% in three years, but I've also collected 13 14% dividend per year. That is why my preferred in the space remains CMH, massive dividend yield, uh, five times PE, little over five times PE, which puts it half the valuation of we buy cars. There is nothing I see in we buy cars that justifies a valuation of that regard. And then we had Calgary results a while ago. Then, of course, now we've just had Baldwin this week. So I thought I'd compare them. Again, I hold Calgary M3. The Baldwin results were a mess. They sold 1,892 units. That was down 896. Uh, revenue was down 29% to $2.4 billion. HEPs was of 48% at uh, just under $0.48. Cents. No dividend. It puts them on a PE of 4.2. Calgary sold... About the same number of units, 1,794. That was down to 1,300 units. Revenue for them was 1.2 billion. Immediately what we can see, they're selling about the same number of units, but uh, Baldwin is selling those units at almost twice the price. And that's what's hurting Baldwin. Calgro, less units sold because they moved away from lower cost, lower margin, student housing and that sort of thing. But they're still selling at around about seven, eight hundred thousand average unit, uh, Baldwin is selling at uh, about one point one, one point two million per average unit, and they are struggling to sell because of interest rates. So, Calgary has got more flexibility in that regard, which is why I like it. Calgary also declared a first dividend. Uh, it's five percent of HEPs at a minimum. That's why it is nine point four nine three five cents. The net asset values. They don't tell the story because both of these companies have got large land banks. And the point of those land banks is that this is land that they will develop in time. So it sits as an asset on their balance sheet. But if they decide not to develop it, what can they do with the land? They're not going to sell it and break it up into thousands of little lots and sell it individually. I mean, they could, but that's not their, 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 their modus operandi. What they would have to do is find another developer. So yeah, I always look at the NAV on these and, and treat them with a twitch or two of caution. Uh, Baldwin has some annuity revenue. It's 132 million of revenue, so it's about 6 or 7% of total revenue. And that is from things like in their estates. They do fiber, and, and that's fairly annuity. Uh, Calgary on the flip side has got Memorial Parks, which is 42 million. They're trying to get that to the point where it will cover head office costs. The world needs houses. South Africa especially needs more houses. These two companies are positioned in that space, but Baldwin is really struggling. I, I, I'm keeping an eye on it, particularly as interest rates start to come down. But at the moment, I hold and like Kelgro. It is my preferred in the two. We are seeing some price weakness. That makes absolute sense. Uh, but nonetheless, some price weakness coming through there. But it, it's not to be unexpected after the hype leading up to the results and then you get the actual news and of course then everything starts to come back down. I want to quickly touch on Centova. I've just been getting some uh, messages coming through that Centova directors have been selling uh, and what do we see here? 400,000 shares for 3 million czar and everyone's getting quite panicky about that. I'm going to say what I always say around directors selling. They are always net sellers. They have to be, right? Because they earn some of their, their, their income and bonuses is, is paid in shares. Now, 
Buying shares in the open market is bullish. Selling shares, to my mind, is neutral. Now, if every director is suddenly selling, sure, then maybe there's something happening here. And in hindsight, like we saw with Transaction Capital and David Herbert, oh, look what he did back in December 2022. He knew stuff. Do they know stuff? Sure, they are directors. Of course they do. Do they understand the mechanics of the market? No. Is he selling because he thinks the share price is going down or business is tough? Well, the share price is going down. We can see that from the chart. Uh, and business is tough. We know that, right? Because uh, the global economy is growing, but at a less uh, a fast clip. So, and there's still some worries about recession out there, but nonetheless. Um, and of course, inflation, interest rates, all of those hurting. But we nothing here that 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 he knows special. I mean, like, that does he have inside information? Like, there's something that's about to break. Like, they're about to declare bankruptcy. No, I mean, you know, he would if they were, but they they they're not about to. I am completely agnostic of directors selling. If there is every director is selling their stake down to zero, okay ask some questions. But a director basically coming along and saying, you know what, hang on a sec, uh, we're just selling a quick three million. And I know for you and I, a quick three million is a significant number, but for, you know, for, for, for the rest of the world, it is not necessarily. Next check, I've got the results here. Let's see if we can find, uh, they often will publish the actual holdings. There he is, Fanzale. Uh, they're not telling us what the holdings are here. Uh, I'd have to dig around and I don't have that information right now. Short answer, director selling does not stress me and I don't think it should necessarily stress you either. It's just, it's one of those things. Directors sometimes sell shares. It's what they do. It's how they earn money. I know there's a lot of, twi a lot of Twitter talk that this is the end of the world. It's not. JC is a registered trademark of the JC Limited. JC Direct is an independent broadcast and is not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has it been authorized or otherwise approved by JC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of JC Limited. That's our disclaimer we have to throw out every week. I know yurks are going to get tired of it in time. We'll leave it there. My name is Simon. We'll be back again next week. It will be Thursday because Wednesday is an election day and I'm not recording on my voting day. So I'll do it Thursday morning as I did this one. As always, look after yourself. And if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all. Bye.